Foxconn. You know, we, we love mobile phones. That's right. <laughs> uh, can everybody hear me? The mic's on. Great. Thank you very much for coming out to our after, uh, late afternoon session on global growth. Uh, we have two great uh, panelists, uh, Eric Schmidt, the uh, CEO of, of Google, uh, Chairman of Google. What, what's your latest title now? Uh, executive <laughs> Chairman, former CEO. Executive Chairman uh, and former CEO and a dear friend. And uh, Christopher uh, Pissarides, um, who teaches macroeconomics at the London School of Economics. Um, you know, one of the one of the big issues that uh, I've been thinking about a lot and, and wrestling with, and it's really going to be the subject of our talk today. So I was so eager to be uh, able to moderate this, is uh, um, really what happens um, as we enter this era of hyperconnectivity um, and the merger of globalization and the IT revolution uh, continue to gather speed. And what does it actually do to jobs? What does it actually do to job growth? Well, we know the internet on balance is a, uh, it's a wonderful job, an innovative innovation creator. Um, but the jobs it tends to um, uh, destroy have been historically um, uh, jobs that uh, a lot of people with uh, out high school or high school degrees have been able to do and lead a, a decent and uh, a middle class lifestyle uh, in their respective countries. And that's changing now. There's a wonderful cover story in The Atlantic this month about um, basically what's happening to jobs. And uh, profiles a young woman actually works in a, uh, uh, a fuel uh, uh, auto parts factory in, uh, in South Carolina. And the author, uh, Adam Davidson, he, he, tells a, uh, uh, he relates a joke in this, uh, in this um, piece. Uh, it's about how factories in, in, in America today become so automated. He said, in fact, there's a joke in the South that today's average you know, um, cotton processing factory has just two employees, uh, a man and a dog. Um, the man is there to feed the dog, and the dog is there to keep the man away from the machines. Um, and so, Christopher, I, I think I'm going to begin with, with that question to you. Um, is, is, that, uh, is that the future of work? It's the future of some work, but not the um, vast quantity of jobs. Otherwise, we would all be unemployed, except for dog owners, I guess. <laughs> Uh, I mean, there's no doubt that the, that the, digi the, the digital revolution is, is a revolution in uh, labor markets as well as uh, everywhere else. It's one of the big technology revolutions that we uh, can uh, see in the history of Western um, yeah, civilization, in the, the history of industrialization. Uh, we can see that everywhere. All jobs need, do use the internet in some way or another. They, they all use computers, whereas a mere 20 years ago, uh, a small number were using it. Those are very big changes. And, and, and when we're talking about globalization and how um, the location of jobs has moved, the size of um, companies that um, produce the goods and services that we have has, has changed, all, that, all this agglomeration of economic activity, this movement across the world, the opening, opening up of countries that were closed before, like uh, China, they, they, they have used the digital um, uh, revolution, they have used the digitalization a, a lot to achieve that. Now, you, now you, you might say, and that, and that I understand is the focus of, of your question, what does this do uh, to labor markets? Now, the, the first thing that um, we should say is that it, 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 it certainly changes the um, structure of employment. It, it reallocates jobs to other countries. The new types of jobs come to our countries. That's always been the feature of, uh, of technological revolutions in the history of industrialization. The first one was in the United Kingdom, and when machines were first invented to do the, the jobs that people used to do, you had the Luddites, for example, who were breaking up the machines because they felt that their jobs were being taken away. That was repeated again uh, middle of the 20th century with the uh, new industrial revolutions, and, they, and, and, and I did find, in fact, a famous quote from uh, President John Kennedy, who said that uh, if um, men, he said at that time, but let's say if, if our citizens are clever enough to invent machines that can do the job of, 
of men, then surely men are clever enough to invent new types of jobs for them to do. Mm -hmm. And that's really spot on. <laughs> because what machines are doing and what the digital revolution has done is to destroy many jobs. You know, think of all those booksellers in the high street, in Main Street, if you prefer American English. Think of um, those selling, uh, those travel agencies in, in Main Street selling, they, 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 they've all gone. Um, they were replaced by new types of jobs. And that's precisely what it is. They, we, there is a process where we're destroying many, many jobs, because of the new technology, they become outdated. We are creating a new type of jobs. Now, the examples I've used are rather small examples within uh, the country, but they're the more obvious ones you know, within single markets. If we look at it as part of the global economy, I would claim that the fact that we lost so many manufacturing jobs in the, in, in the Western industrial societies to countries like China, it depends a lot on our ability to um, uh, carry on trade between it at the speed that we do, and that depends on, 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 on digitalization. Without uh, computers, without the internet, I doubt whether we have been able to, to do that. Collecting all the information, of course, the manufacturing jobs are not going to come back to our countries, despite what some very prominent people may have said recently. Um, but they're being replaced by other types of jobs that are mainly non-traded uh, services. Uh, of course, we do still need to produce traded what, what, goods. What are some examples of those? Of, of the non I mean, can we all be hairdressers and barbers and masseuses? Um, no, you're more, more, you're more likely to be nurses uh -huh. <laughs> if, you're, if you're American. If you, yeah, if you want a decent job. The, the sector in, in America that uh, created more jobs than any other in the last 20 years is the health sector. It's, it's the provision of, of personal services. I, I, again, that I, I would give a big role, in fact, to the digital revolution for that because what the digital revolution has done is to increase productivity and increase earnings a lot in certain kind of sectors. You know, think of finance as the main one, but but there are other sectors, even you know, software companies. Those jobs are jobs where the top incomes have really increased a lot, and when. And when you, are, you work so, such long hours, when you get all those big incomes, then you expect better services um, at, at the personal level. There are many things that you used to be at home. You know, maybe you got the vacuum cleaner and you went around the carpets. If you had time, you don't have the time to do that anymore. You hire someone to do it. More importantly, you, you get the childcare services for all elderly parents, you hire top qualified um, nursing staff to, to look after them. That creates a lot of jobs. It also creates a kind of segregation or bifurcation, again, translate into American English, of, uh, of, um, of jobs. I think that's, uh, that's inevitable and that's where our governments could help to make all jobs uh, look good and meet the expectations of people, but it's that, that type of job that is being right. created now that we've lost the manufacturing jobs. Eric, how do you, how do you see this? Um, you've had just a unique perch of having really presided over the emergence of this. How many employees at Google today? Um, more than 30,000. More than 30, so you saw it to literally go from zero to 30,000 basically. I mean, not zero, from two to 30,000. Um, what have you learned from that experience and what are you learning today from what Google's doing in the world. The, um, the, the story that Chris has been talking about is one that's been going on for hundreds of years. Uh, and it's important not to fear technological innovation and revolution. Uh, these kinds of changes are what caused us to have clean water, high quality of life, invention of new law, new legal theories, and so forth. And it's natural for people to fear such changes. But most of the arguments that I hear are fear-based arguments rather than fact-based arguments. Um, and, and at Google, we, you know, we have a pledge we asked um, in America, the politicians to give. Um, and we asked them to say, in God we trust. And they say, in God we trust. And then we say, everyone else has to bring some data to the conversation. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is that what the professor has said is, is not only correct, but it's true in many, many countries. 
And the fact of the matter is that McKinsey, for example, released a report today that indicated that in 30 emerging countries, roughly the interesting ones that we'd like to talk about at Davos, there's a roughly 3.5 jobs created for every one lost. So the phenomenon that you're talking about, about job creation from technology innovation, is in fact net positive. There's no question that people who are not as educated, not as disciplined, not exposed to the markets as much, are affected negatively. This is no different from the loom when it was invented mm -hmm. and the impact that it had. And I don't think any of us would want to go and somehow delete the loom from, from exactly. the world. Because of, and furthermore, I think if you look at over the next decade or two, this rate of technological innovation is not slowing down. Uh, in the article that you talked about in The Atlantic and in many other surveys, what's happening, by the way, is that there's an evidence of a resurgence of manufacturing. Now, we thought manufacturing, and classic economists say that manufacturing is just declining as a percentage in modern Western societies in the same way that, that pharma has, because it was automated. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that that's true in aggregate, but there's also a huge labor shortage for highly skilled manufacturing people mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. simply straightforward to use sophisticated machinery tools and so forth. The next generation in manufacturing is called the maker society where we can actually manufacture a product that's distinctly for you and do that with automated tools. So what I would say is that at first I would not fear this and I would understand that there's sociological and societal dis dislocations from it, but this is how the world gets better. This is how the way the GDP grows. This is ultimately how we leave the world in a better place for our children. Well, let me push back on that a little for the sake of our, our discussion. It, no question, this is the history of the world. Um, mm -hmm. Technology, uh, whether it's the cotton gin or the steam engine you know, supplanting, if horses could vote, there never would have been cars. Okay? <laughs> I mean, we know, we know that. Um, so this is always going on. But is this, a, um, the question I want to ask you both is, is this a difference of degree that's a difference in kind? And let me, let me put this example. And, and will this difference of degree end up actually being the true crisis of capitalism? I'll put it this I live in Bethesda, Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C., uh, 40, 50 miles from Baltimore. Uh, biggest employer in Baltimore 50 years ago was Bethlehem Steel Company. Now, in those days, as a, uh, as a male, um, I could drop out of high school, uh, join the steel union, get a job at the steel plant, earn an average wage, doing an average job, um, uh, buy an average house with an average yard, have an average number of kids, um, lead an average night lifestyle, um, go to an average baseball game uh, in the summer, and retire on an average pension. Uh, average was... And have, and, and have 2.2 .2 children. Right, I said, yeah. I, uh, um, uh, average was, was, uh, could actually lead to a decent lifestyle. Yeah. Biggest employer in Baltimore today is Johns Hopkins University Medical Center. Um, they do not let you cut the grass at Johns Hopkins without a BA. Um, and so the real question I'm asking is <clears throat> what you said, Eric, and I, of course I share everything you're saying, it is a net positive. Oh, but this is good for the world. But it feels like this time, let me, let me, let me, by, by the way, when you're living through it, it's always yeah. different right. from the guys before. Right. When the buggy went out, they had the same conversation at right. the pre-Davos. Yeah, the, the I, thing that's, I'm going to push back on there that. Are two I, yeah. things, there are two things that are different. Yeah. Okay? The first is that one of the histories in the last hundred years has been that time is compressed. If you go back and you look at what's happened, the amount of, and this has a lot to do with information networks, the amount of time that you have to think and anticipate and so forth, and it's true because of the development of radio and the development of television. There are people who have studied this and have said that with each expansion of network and contraction of time, you have a bubble because of the expectations of op an opportunism that it creates. So that's one thing. And the second is the, the true exposure of markets to globalized forces, which was not true until 20 or 30 years ago. And you go back there to the gold standard and the, the changes that, that our predecessors put through. Those make the crisis very real and every day. Right. Right. So the bankers used to be able to bank in the morning, play golf, bank in the afternoon. They can't do it anymore. They're just as stressed as the people in the online world because they're in 24-hour businesses. Now you say, is that a loss of their lifestyle? They can't play as much golf. On the other hand, it draws a different kind of person. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, I think the policy answer goes back to governments have to do something which is hard. They actually have to do what they say with respect to investing in human capital. All of us, and I suspect all of you who've looked at this, 
The core argument here is one of education, investing in education, especially in needed areas, uh, because that's ultimately the, the resource that we have before us to, to solve these problems. There's no other solution. And, and that, you know, that's borne up by the statistics. The latest Bureau of Labor uh, Department statistics say if you um, have not graduated from college, unemployment rate in America is 13 percent. If you've graduated, if you've not graduated from high school, if you've graduated from high school, the unemployment rate is about 8.7 percent. Mm. If you've graduated from high school and have um, a little post-secondary education, it's 7.1 percent. And if you have a four-year post-secondary degree in any realm, it's now 4.1 percent. There are plenty of companies in the United States and some of the other countries I've visited um, that are very short, highly skilled workers. Right? That's a public policy failure to have anticipated that to get those people. We can use them. We can hire them. In America, we further don't let them in the country. And if we do educate in the country, we kick them out. Brilliant strategy. Could I, Please. Could, could I, come in? I mean, you're saying, you're saying it's, a, it's a public policy failure. Why, why isn't it a failure of the private company that hasn't gone to the university and say what kind of training they really want to see? We do this all the time. We do this every day. So why, why, why don't universities respond? Well, first place, universities are. We are, we are, a, huge, we are a huge hire of, of, of the top people. I was making a more generic point. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, graduation rates in most Western countries are 25% to one-third to one mm -hmm. of the eligible population mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. could go to college. Yeah. This is a huge issue. Uh, there are technological solutions. So you have a curious person who didn't go to college. We can now, through YouTube and Facebook and other technologies, get them the information that they need. Mm. But they have to be motivated to do that. And, and there's evidence that people are. Mm. Eric, um, I want to um, think of giving up this journalism thing and um, trying to get a job at Google. Um, and so I want to go back to school. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm really curious, from an HR point of view, um, what is Google looking for in, in an employee today? Now, besides the normal metric of you know, being a whiz at you know, computing or, or, or math or whatever, is there something new from when you graduated from college and got your first engineering job? Uh, it's interesting that the, the people we hire today are uh, in many ways more used to working in teams. So we select for that. Hmm. Um, there are people who are so bizarrely antisocial hmm. that even, even we won't hire them. <laughs> even if they're like, just like this, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, totally we, genius. And, and it, it's, it's sort of a terrible it loss, is, terrible loss to yeah. humanity that we can't but get that, them in. But we just yeah. can't really quite work with them. Huh. But, but as a general statement, this, this set of uh, graduates is more socially concerned, more used to working in teams. And that's good. Because virtually all the problems that are going to be facing businesses, um, politicians, and so forth going forward hmm. will, be done, will be solved by teams. There's relatively few lone practitioners these days. What we look for is the kind of creative intelligence that can, people, that can allow people to solve a new and unanticipated problem. Hmm. Uh, if you look at the sort of literature about education, the, most, the best and deepest education occurs when the student can solve a problem in a new way, and the professor, gifted professors, can say, and get them to think about, here's another approach, here's mm. another approach. Mm. And one of the uh, results of the fact that there's no time and globalization is you're always pivoting. And much of the complaint that I hear from industries is that they are unable to pivot, mm. either because their shareholders won't let them, or their regulators won't let them, or so forth. And I think the reality is that, that the globalization forces you to confront changes to your business model every day. And unfortunately or fortunately, that's reality. I think people would be just curious, and I want to follow up with a question on Europe for Christopher. Um, what is the hiring process? That is, do I take a test? Do I take a test online, then do I get an interview? How does it actually work? Um, we have many, many thousands of applications every day. Um, we used to interview people for days. And we had to put in a pol we had to We tested the quality of our interviewing. And we initially restricted it to eight interviews, and now we've actually reduced it to five interviews. We found statistically that five interviews were a pretty accurate predictor of, of hiring success or not. We have essentially no turnover once we're hired, so we're sort of stuck with the people, right. so we need to make the decision yeah. right. And we give everybody a test. Um, if you're a programmer, we give you tests that are they're, they're like IQ tests, and they're problem-solving tests. If you're a marketing person, we give you a sort of a task to market something. A salesperson has to do a sales job. An executive has to write a little essay about what they're going to do. 
Um, what we don't tell them, by the way, is at the end we read the essay and then throw it away. Uh -huh. Because what we're really looking for is, is critical thinking. Um, mm -hmm. Do they understand the problem at hand? Can they, can they articulate what they might do? We're more interested in, as I said, in the ability to think of how the problem is going to, because it's going to change again. Um, and the internet in particular presents new opportunities every day. The internet in my time at Google has gone from relatively a static model of information to this much, much more dynamic model around people and the generation of information. On a, on a there are various statistics, but over, the la you know, over a couple of days now, we generate as much information on the internet as we did between the dawn of man and you know, the year 2000. Um, so the growth rate of, of the connectedness and what people are doing is a staggering number. And people are wandering around with these, these phones and phone equivalents generating an enormous number of things that you're interested in. Yeah. Christopher, in this kind of world, um, global, driven by the IT revolution, will all the kind of cultural differences get arbitraged out? That is, uh, you know, will Europe produce a Google now very soon? Um, um, or, or, you know, this kind of hyper-competitive, hyper-connected capitalism, will we see it appear in the Middle East, Africa, Asia? Mm -hmm. is, this, is this going to become universal now? It, it's becoming a lot more universal than it used to. I mean, it's not going to produce a Google because we already have one. <laughs> and, and we use it. We Europe has produced Skype. Mm -hmm. some of that, that's the equivalent you're saying. And... Uh, and, and I'm astonished sometimes that I visit countries in Europe and they say, by the way, you know, we invented such and such. And, and you know, Skype is the only one I can remember right now, but, but, but there are others. And, and, and it's true, I mean, there, I mean, there are people working in, in giving new, innovating solutions to problems that, uh, that, that were pointed out. Uh, that's correct. Now, what, what I wanted to ask, uh, though, uh, that you said five interviews and, and you want them to have certain um, qualifications, but how, how many of the 30,000 of your employees have gone through that uh, procedure before being hired? Um, every one. Every one? Yeah. Except for the two founders. Well, yeah. <laughs> except for the man and the dog. <laughs> well, the two founders got it right. Because... Uh, because that, I, I mean, that's correct, but, but at the very top end of the, uh, of, of the employment uh, the well, uh, distribution, and, and, I, I would claim, you know, when you look at the whole spectrum of, of jobs being created. We, we actually, we, we review every hire in the company, and Larry, now CEO, and before us, and just his founder role, mm -hmm. personally reviews every hire. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the level of commitment. Mm -hmm. If you want to build yeah. a company that's built on intelligent people, uh, of a particular kind. You have to be ruthless with respect to your adoption of processes that will produce such people. There are plenty of other companies that have done this, not mm -hmm. just Google, uh, but, but ours works well for us. Mm -hmm. One of the frightening things, though, uh, you know, if you, when you think about it, though, if you take um, Google, um, Facebook, Twitter, Zynga, um, uh, LinkedIn, some, some of the five of the sort of hottest app, even Apple to some extent, I think you could probably fit all their employees in the LA Coliseum. Um, okay. uh, but let's, let's not reason from specific examples. Mm -hmm. um, each of the companies that you're describing um, has generated enormous platform ecosystems of companies. Right. Trillions of dollars of wealth, commerce, and so forth are enabled mm -hmm. by these scalable yeah. network mm -hmm. platforms. Uh, they've affected, in my view, mostly positively, mm -hmm. education, financial markets, distribution of media, and so forth. So picking the lever point to make the general point is probably not correct. Mm -hmm. um, a reasonable expectation is that the access to the Internet, this time pressure I'm discussing, the globalization of markets, will in fact produce some very large and strategic companies but also a very large number of smaller companies because the barrier to entry for being an entrepreneur and entering a small company is much lower. Uh, mathematically, if you look at this, they tend to follow something which is known as Zipf's Law, which mm -hmm. says that you tend to get, because of network concentration, you tend to get a small number of flagship corporations, such as in this industry, and then a very, very large tail of, of corporations that, that build and, and add value in that. And I think that's probably the true of all networked economies. Mm -hmm. So, Christopher, if this is the world we're going into, what are the three most important public policy initiatives any government has to think about? Okay, let me, let me um, 
um, back, backtrack a little bit. The, in, in terms of value added, in terms of GDP, wealth creation, there is no doubt that, uh, that, 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 the, that this is correct, that, the, that these companies generated an, an enormous wealth, much more than we had before um, the network revolution has done. In terms of actual jobs, they, they created high-profile jobs, but whichever way you count them, they don't come up even up to 10% of employment in, in any country. Uh, they don't come up to? To 10% to of jobs that we're creating in, in any country. The, the, the large number of jobs that have been created are jobs that are created essentially to serve the, 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 the demands that, that the, the, the people who are at, at the top and with the incomes have, you know, the kind of services I described before. So uh, you do get the, this, um, the, this segregation or, or bifurcation. In fact, you started, I thought you started wanting to ask that question, but, but you, you, you got oh. sidetracked that the average and average blah 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 yes. it doesn't exist and, and I agree with you entirely that that even though you still have the uh, average to some extent it's certainly not the way it was when um, you were living in, in Baltimore uh, when you started yes. the say years ago um, now the the kind of jobs that we see and hear about are, are the highly paid jobs at one and and, and the mass of labor intensive kind of activities mm. at the other so coming back to um, what are the public policy challenges? I think public policy challenge number one is how do you deal with the um, inequalities that arise in such a system because we know that uh, inequality and especially increasing inequality of, of the kind we've uh, seen in, uh, in, in our industrialized economies recently are, it, are not popular. Yeah. You know, they, they cost politicians votes. <laughs> they, 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 in some countries, might, they might lead to demonstrations and riots in the street from the lower-paid people against wealth. They have Occupy Wall Street, you know that kind. I, I think that's the biggest challenge that we're facing, uh, that public policy is facing now. And, and I leave the other two challenges to you, <laughs> to, you to, to come up with. Eric, what would be your list? What would you like to see, uh, particularly this election year? But uh, what, what, what are the, the key policy initiatives, if you could wave a magic wand in America, you'd well, like to see? Well, each, each country is different. Uh, in the United States, um, 8 or 9% of the employment was tied to this uh, incredibly inexpensive credit boom, which caused overbuilding um, in both commercial and residential markets. The problem of the of the private housing market and the collapse there is not a solved problem. Mm -hmm. um, I've always assumed that if enough smart people get in the room and argue it out, we could come up with mm -hmm. a system which was a shared pain model. Um, so, so, so I agree with the professor that um, the aggregate employment is not high tech. High tech is somewhere between three and five percent right. by yeah. most of the numbers. That's so that's, that's, that's roughly that's correct. That's so the 95 percent are in more traditional industries but they can be served by innovation sure. as well. So let's hear a new way to solve that problem. In Europe, the issues, as we all know, have to do with have more flexible labor markets, structural reforms, and so forth, which are the core topic of Davos. Mm -hmm. It's important to remember, when I first started coming to Davos almost 20 years ago, there was a, there was a perception that there was going to be a permanent 20% unemployment level, because France at the time was 13, and heading up, this is in the early to mid-90s, because the system was so, so rigid. And then, of course, the changes occurred with the euro, and now we're facing a similar set of concerns in at least the southern part of Europe. Ultimately, the answer is that governments need to get their act together with respect to supporting the, the parts of their economy that create jobs. Jobs are created, at least in America, by two groups, export-oriented large multinationals and small businesses. The export-oriented multinationals tend to have a global footprint. They benefit from globalization. Mm -hmm. They benefit from scale. This is true, by the way, in Europe as well. Uh, small businesses benefit from specialization. And there's no better tool for a small business to use than to use the Internet to find that market, to find that market and reach their customers because it's so inexpensive to do one now. Mm -hmm. I wanna, we have um, a few minutes. I want to open it up to the uh, audience for questions up there. Um, uh, some people with microphones um, that will be circulating. And if you would uh, raise your hand if you'd like the microphone. 
Um, uh, our, our, our mics are in the rows here. And identify yourself. The lights have gone up. And uh, do we have any takers? There's a question over there. Yeah, right here. And there's a question one, over there. One, one, one there and then one here. Thank you. Right down here. Yeah. And God I trust, but where did the statistic about 3.5 jobs created for every one lost come from? Um, it's a McKinsey report re uh, released today. You can read the report on the McKinsey.com website. Thank you. You get another question that was so short. It's <laughs> like the White House. Um, we got a question up right up here in the front row. And somebody back there? It was there somebody over here? I'm sorry, because I a little, little bright. Back there, we've got some too. So we'll just let the you move around. All right, uh, Drew from Dropbox. Um, my question is, what do we do when we have you know all these BAs and, and people with advanced degrees who are you know learn about all this stuff, but then are confined to you know cutting grass or different things that that um, you know maybe don't exercise that what they might not feel like it exercises their potential. You know, what would you do with a kind of you know what kinds of cultural issues arise from this. By I'm sorry, so which PhDs in which subjects? Uh, just, just asking in general, what happens when you have, you know, all these kids who are graduating? Are you talking about the present now? You, you, are you describing the, the present? In, or? In, the, in the future, or, you know, just... If this Why do you assume that's the future? I think, let, let me try to clarify. Just, just use your example of, of the BA cutting grass. Mm. I mean, the question is, to paraphrase slightly, but I think I, but is that now that the, the structure of employment is changing so rapidly, you have many BAs coming out of university or others with a certain kind of training that may have been well suited to the employment that we had five or ten years ago, but not anymore, and there might be disappointment in their expectations. Is that what you ask? The, the, the only solution to that that I would suggest actually is that is that universities themselves <clears throat> and schools when training they, they should mold the expectations of their um, students in such a way that they would be more flexible to face the um, new realities that we have with globalization I mean there's no point in the university saying I, I'm going to teach you this kind of uh, skill and make sure you do it, because if you don't, it's the fault of those big companies that go off and do other things. I, I mean, you know, universities are there uh, to, to serve the <coughs> companies in the sense of, of giving them uh, solutions of where to go next, given the, the possibilities and constraints that uh, the global economy is giving you. So there shouldn't be any expectations. There should be people thinking that what they're, what they're learning is more of a springboard to jump into new types of, uh, of jobs and enhance their learning in, in other ways and move uh, forward. And good universities should be, should be doing that. Does that mean, should we get rid of the tenure system? For professors? Yeah. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's, there's a couple more. There's a couple over here, and there's a couple over there. Yeah. yeah, you can just, if you see just a hand, just yeah. give them the mic. Yeah. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, Peter Goodman of the Huffington Post. I just want to ask, isn't the uh, job retraining argument really just a red herring for lack of progressive taxation? I mean, particularly in the United States, where you could take all of the people who have officially been unemployed for six months or longer, and you could if you could magically send them to associate degree programs, they're not, a lot of those people are never going to get jobs. They're not going to get jobs in five years, ten years. Whereas if you were to address the inequality, uh, which you've already addressed in this conversation, but address it in an active way and move some of the money around, you'd probably create underlying demand that would generate jobs even for people of lower skills. What, what, what am I missing? So what, can I ask you, so what you're Ask you ways because there is this interesting argument, but there really is no structural jobs problem. It's an aggregate demand problem. I mean, there's clearly some people, yeah. uh, or there are some companies always throughout the history of capitalism who can't find enough high skilled people for the jobs at any given moment. But that's not the, the big picture according to the data. And so I'm, I'm wondering whether we're just missing the real question, which is you know, if we had a taxation structure such that we didn't have all this capital that is the result of highly successful 
wealth creating companies like Google uh, concentrated in too few hands, there'd be more consumer power and there'd be more employment. Is, is that wrong? Um, I, I think you're, you're picking one part of a very complex political argument. If I were to follow that argument, then the U.S. has a trillion dollar deficit every year, which is we, the politicians argue over who gets that. They're spending money that they don't have. Why is that number not two trillion and just give the one trillion to the group that you're describing to have them create aggregate demand? If you follow the reasoning, so, so th to me, the, the, the question without the context is sort of, sort of not really well formed. The, there is a problem of demand. Demand comes from a set of factors, including confidence, right, a feeling that my money that I invest in the bank will be secure, that my currency is strong, and so forth. There is not agreement even between, for example, Europeans and the United States over whether a, 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 a policy of massive, massive stimulation of the economy uh, which might result in, uh, in inflation at some point in the future, is desirable over the contraction that Europe seems to have sort of uh, self-done, if you will, by virtue of its uh, processes in the last few months. So I don't, th I don't think you can answer the question you're asking without looking at all those other variables. At the end of the day, the productivity of the, of the world comes from automating and investing and dealing new products and new services and that's how the lot of the humanity improves, right? So for every job that was sort of lost in, in manual work that's replaced by an automated job with somebody operating it, their quality, if you go to Hawaii, right, they, they become a tourist industry and they replace pineapple picking jobs. Well, the pineapple picking jobs were much harder than working in the tourism industry and the wages are higher too. So there, there's example, example after that. I don't think it's just about wealth and concentration and so forth. Let's go over to this side of the room if we can, but please, yeah. Yeah, hi, it's, it's uh, following on from this line of conversation, particularly for, for Eric Schmidt, but I'd like to hear from the other panelists as well. We know that there is a, a growing jobs crisis. We're hearing more and more leaders talk about unemployment, but we know there's not a work crisis in the sense there's still loads of work to be done. And so what's just happened is there's a shrinkage in the, the amount of money in the economy for people to, to, to be working for each other. So I was wondering, in that context, and in a context where governments, some governments don't want to go further in, into debt, could Google create a currency to get the world back to work? I think that currency is information. Mm -hmm. And I think it's up to you as to how you use that, <laughs> use that information. Our part in helping is we believe, and we're very proud, of the many, many, many businesses that are enabled by the advertising platform that we power. And I'm sure other tech companies would say the same thing. Whoever's got a hand up, just feel free to give them. Go ahead, please, yeah. Can you identify yourself? It's nice to know who's out there. Uh, Ron Freeman, Atlantic Council, Washington, D.C. I wonder if Google database of candidates who have been turned down for a job by Google could be the source of information fed back into the education system about what we need to do more? Um, we have pretty strict privacy policies, and I would certainly not want to violate the privacy of any of those people. Not intended. Um, but we do, in fact, talk to our suppliers, if you will, our human suppliers, about the kinds of people we need. But I was trying to make a more, this is not a conference about Google recruiting. The way we solve the problems in our society is by having more educated people who don't react with foolishness and lack of data and without analytical thinking. The way wars happen is people get upset and they start shooting each other rather than reasoning and conversation. It's actually really understand. You, our, the universities of the world, in particular uh, the leading universities that we source from, have done an enormous, an enormous gift right, to give us people who can engage in this kind of abstract reasoning and thinking. The, the thing that separates us up from, for example, the Middle Ages, is the development of that and so forth. There's some evidence, uh, for example, in economic theory, that there's a sort of a trap that many countries get to. It's called the middle income trap. And that above that, those countries have to have developed the kind of extraordinarily sophisticated governance and educational systems that are exemplified by some of the very fine countries here in Europe, the United States, and a number in Asia. Could I, 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 can, can, Please, can I say something? It's, it, it's dangerous, actually, to think of someone applying for a job and not getting it that he or she is a failure. Uh, 
you know, if, if, first of all, for, for each job that um, is advertised that at, at all levels in the market, there are many, many more applications. People apply to many jobs. And, and that, in fact, if I might say so, is the foundation of what's known as the theory of matching in labor markets, uh, which mm -hmm. uh, was said at the beginning. I mean, pe people have different kinds of skills, which might be differentiated horizontally, you might say. You know, it's not that one person is better than another, but one person is more suited to one type of job th than another. It doesn't mean that the, that the, the school or the university that trained the one who succeeded to get a job at, at Google and the other one that either Google or, or the person uh, herself decided that um, they are better suited to some other uh, job and applied in some other job. It doesn't mean that one is a, the university has made a success of one of them and they, and they failure of another. It, it's very, very difficult to identify uh, failures in uh, labor markets. So, and since we, we, we're talking a lot about jobs, what's striking to me is that the jobless problem, for whatever we want to call it, and this, this explosion in young people um, is a problem that's throughout the world. So we talk about it in an American context or a European context, but virtually every government is dealing with this. And we should study from some of the success models, in particular the German model, which did very hard work. And people forget that Germany, roughly five years ago, actually in an agreement with the labor unions, lowered wage rates to make things more competitive, decided to in increase their investment in, they have a technical set of training programs for technicians that have produced enormously productive workers who are not suited or choose not to go to college, and they took a national identity around becoming an export manufacturer for some categories of exports. It's worked remarkably for them. Um, so there's every reason to believe that if the political leadership, the business leadership in a country deals with this, they can do it. One way to think about it is that, that the disconnect that you're hearing is that the national politicians want to rule the nation, hopefully in a democracy, but they're, they're being affected by globalization. And globalization keeps winning against their theory. If globalization didn't occur in our little country, say the three of us, we could just say, well, they're the best, we're the happiest, we have everything, we have everything we need. But globalization gives you a metric, it keeps you competitive, it gives you more information. But the sum of globalization is the world is better off. And for all the people who are globalization critics, and, and I assume almost everybody here agrees that globalization is wonderful, the fact that globalization has brought a couple billion people from absolute poverty to what we would define as a lower middle class to middle class existence, and what they would argue is a middle class existence to an upper middle class existence, is a huge, you know, a huge accomplishment in our lifetimes. Eric, before we close, um, you've just come from Tunisia yeah. and Libya, and we have a lot of people here from the Middle East and, the, and talking about the Arab Spring. Um, all of these uh, post-Arab awakening societies we now have huge youth unemployment, yeah. 25, 30, 40 percent. Where do countries like that, do you think, start to tackle this problem? What, what I particularly like about your question is the answer is it's not America's fault. <laughs> okay? It's not Europe's fault. And, all my, and, and there's this tendency for the Western world, and in particular America, to say, well, let's go in, we want to fix it, and so forth and so on. The wonderful thing that's going on in the Arab world is the conversation is within the citizens of the country. Now, the challenge is I was in Libya for a few days, and imagine a situation where you had a, a, a terrible dictator who imprisoned people and tortured people and so forth and so on. You had a civil war. Um, you had 85% of the people in the country work for essentially one company, which is the oil industry. There's not a lot of local competition. Um, they don't trust the judges, so they push them to the side. They don't trust the police, so they push them to the side. There's 80 militias running around inside the country. Um, it was a uh, leaderless revolution with uh, a transition council, and they're trying to decide right now what their constitution looks like. Oh, and I forgot. Everyone I spoke with owned a gun. <laughs> The great thing about that scenario, and by the way, these are the nicest people in the world, every one of them, welcoming, friendly. Uh, I cannot say enough nice things, and we should help them. The way we help them is let them work on their own problems and help them understand what the best of governance, the best strategic approaches, mm -hmm. and so forth. I, I was going to say, and, and, um, and, and especially with you, since you really are an expert and I'm just a tourist mm -hmm. in this stuff, if you have an opportunity to build a country just from scratch today because of a bad dictator who was exiled or killed or what have you, I think you would conclude that one of the components of your constitution 
is you would write in an the, uh, a statement about the importance of having an uncensored internet. And here's why. If, you're con if your citizens are connected together, and if you have a rule, for example, let's say we have a rule, most of these countries have the biggest problem is in fact corruption. Let's say we have a rule that the politicians as part of running have to disclose their assets, you know, the houses and cars and horses and so forth and so on. And furthermore, that citizens can keep their eye on the real number and that it's a crime to mislead that. You might discover that half the politicians aren't running anymore. But the politicians that you get are the ones that are really committed to serving the, the, the leaders. Another thing that you might discover, as long as you have a ballot box, is that the citizens can, in fact, communicate with each other and discover that their government has gone awry. The thing I learned the most about the Arab Spring was that we take the internet for granted here and, and all of us live in, um, certainly the majority of people here in Davos live in worlds which are not heavily censored. When you live in a country where censorship is the norm and you assume the phones are tapped, the televisions are completely censored, the radios are completely censored, and everybody's kind of afraid to say stuff, the internet is your only communications mechanism. It's fundamental to your political expression. I think we should, just to go on, we should celebrate the rise of these Arab democracies as democracy moves throughout the globe. Terrific. Uh, Chris, do you want to uh, say anything in closing? Um, uh, just to sum up your thoughts on... Yes, well, so, well I, I, I agree entirely with the, with the big pictures. Now, the, the smaller picture of, of how do you deal with mass unemployment and low employment in these countries, I, I would begin by completely liberalizing their labor markets mm. and telling everyone that public sector employment has ended because what, what, has, what has really held these North African and Middle Eastern Good countries point. down is that the public sector has always offered the best jobs. They're all queuing to get into mm -hmm. the public sector. That, that should end. Just liberalize the labor markets. Find what you are best at doing um, and, and, and do it and export to Europe or, or, or even Africa itself, as we heard yesterday at the Africa debate here. That's where the, they should begin with the uh, job. Terrific. Creation. Well, this is a great discussion. If I don't close it, I will lose my job. So thank you all for coming out, and thank the two of you. Yeah, thank so you, Tom. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Mm -hmm.